Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I'm Megan Marquardt, and I'm here today with Matt Hykalis and Dave Christofferson. I can see a lot of attendees are in attendance, and we're really happy to see you here. So thanks a lot for taking time out of your day. Before I hand this over to Matt and Dave, I just wanted to let you know that if at any time during this webinar you have a question, go ahead and feel free to just type a uh, question in the question and answer box, and we'll get those to the get to those at the end of um, Dave's webinar. So without further ado, here's Matt. Thanks, Megan. On behalf of AP Tech, we appreciate you all joining us today for part one of a two-part series on biocides. Part one focuses on biocide options for controlling microbial activity in biofilm and middle market industrial, commercial and institutional cooling tower waters. I would like to introduce today's presenter, Dave Christofferson. Dave has 43 years of water treatment experience managing and designing water treatment programs. Uh, for a wide range of industries and applications for boiler, cooling, and wastewater systems to membrane and ion exchange technologies. Dave's work also has also entailed product development and product formulation for water treatment chemicals. He's designed and operated field pilot systems for various chemical and equipment applications and has extensive laboratory treatability experience. Dave's held many roles over the years of note being the technical director at Crown Solutions for 20 years and a global water treatment chemical additives director for Veolia Water Technologies for 14 years. He has also served on the board of the Association of Water Technologies along with contributing significantly to the organization through papers, presentations, and trainings. Dave, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks Matt. I noticed on the registration list quite a few people out there that I uh, know or friends of mine. So hi to you. Hi to everyone else too. And like Megan said, thanks for um, taking time and joining this webinar. This is uh, going to be a big overview look at, at biocide treatment uh, and biofilm and, and biological control and cooling systems, but more specifically to the uh, institutional commercial mid market. Uh, type cooling tower, so I want to make a differentiation uh, on those kinds of things. So uh, looking just from a starting point, I, I want to cover if we can kind of conceptualize uh, the whole biological process. How do biofilms form? What are we trying to control in a in a cooling system? Because uh, we're really trying to control planktonic bacteria, biofilm, Legionella, other things. Um, and like I said, I want to try to differentiate between uh, clean water systems and you know a little bit more um, difficult waters uh, all the way up to what I would call dirty water systems and really differentiate because I think um, clean water systems lower risk of biological problems probably a little easier to make selections and then it gets uh, progressively more difficult. Um, I'm going to go through quite a few of the treatment options. I know that um, people kind of develop their own preferences and so forth, so I've done the same thing over my years. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my, my experience or my background and, and maybe some uh, reasons why I say the same things that I do. Um, and then lastly, um, but also throughout this presentation, the point for AP Tech is that they have um, some best fits, some places where solid products are ideal fits, um, and we've been working on those kinds of guides and guidelines. So the biocide portion of that can fit right in with uh, where are the best fits for some of the solid uh, biocides available from AP Tech. Um, and so the, the places where solid products work well in cooling towers are for relatively low flow systems or low blowdown flows. Um, besides all the other things where you need the safety and the, and the advantages of not having to lug heavy drums into awkward places, the, the dries certainly should replace five gallon pails and, and other applications and up to certain flows. And usually in the clean water applications, a solid program, I think, will fit in well with those and be part of the whole best fit or ideal fit um, strategies. Just to start with and make you aware if you aren't already, these are the core main products that AP Tech would 
normally apply um, in a clean water application. The BCDMH or the halogenated bromine uh, hydantoin products, the uh, uh, dichloroisocyanurate um, duraclor. Uh, then the non-oxidizing, the primary non-oxidizing biocide is DBNPA, um, which I want to talk quite a bit about. Um, and then from a general dispersion standpoint, they have the DTA2 chemistry as a primary product, but we also have others here at AP Tech, and we'll, we'll look at that kind of at the end of the presentation. Probably most of you don't need the background, but always have to have a, sh a short background uh, of what the whole situation is and in, in cooling tower systems part of a comprehensive treatment program always includes something to maintain or, or to control uh, biological problems you know we're really uh, concerned with legionella these days uh, with the increase of that uh, greater public awareness so we have to kill bacteria so that they're not aerosoled um, and inhaled um, the slime is a huge problem from a professional um, and uh, performance um, requirement because of in influence on the cooling tower itself, on heat exchangers and so forth. Um, everybody knows starting maybe in the 80s, the microbiologically influenced corrosion concern and, and knowing now that biofilms are kind of at the center of all water treatment, including corrosion. Um, I'm going to concentrate mostly on bacteria and biological, but we also are concerned certainly about algae and, and uh, fungal mats, maybe not as much with less wood and cooling towers, but the biocide program has to address all of these. So that's the background. From a clean water versus, uh, you know, a little bit higher risk water to a little bit um, dirtier water or very dirty water or difficult system, it really um, starts with water and location. So if we start with a clean water, um, that's better. A clean water is like a well-treated municipal water, um, probably still has a chlorine residual in it, um, or well water, something that doesn't start with a biological problem. Yeah, sure, my little bacteria might slip through here or there, a Legionella gets started because of a, release from biofilm in a city main or something. But for the most part, a clean water application in the CNI market and bid market um, is starting with clean water. Um, if we start with dirtier water, you know, recycled water, municipal wastewater, um, those kinds of things, and that makes it a little bit more difficult and more challenging. And the decision-making process may be more complicated. Um, and then the location of the cooling tower then really becomes an important part because if you have contaminated air, which all air is, you're continuously bringing in bacteria, but you can also bring in suspended solids and bacteria likes to hang on to suspended solids. You bring in nutrients, maybe process contaminations, maybe the towers located near a, a um, a vent of some sort that's providing some solvent that the bacteria like, or you're near a food plant, or you have a, you know, corn silo nearby. All of those things contribute then to the, the potential for biofilm growth and bacteria proliferation. So I'm going to try to conceptualize this whole thing about um, bacteria control and, and biofilm control in, in a cooling system with the next couple of slides. And I think the easiest way to do that is let's just start new. Let's say we have a brand new system, brand spanking new, no biofilm, no bacteria that we know of. And uh, we fill it up with water, good municipal water. Everything's fine. Well, what happens? Well, we start the cooling tower and bacteria, what happens? We're bringing in air continuously. So planktonic bacteria are entering the cooling system uh, continuously. And then those bacteria, they start doing things. Um, they start um, making it throughout the system. The more complicated the system, the more dead legs there are, um, the better places there are for them to set up shop, to create a home, to raise a family, create biofilm. And now we have a planktonic level that's substantial in the cooling system. We have a biofilm. And the biofilm starts growing and getting thicker and due to agitation and flow and so forth, some of that biofilm sloughs off. 
uh, migrates, starts biofilms somewhere else. And now we've got a system where we're managing um, biofilm and managing bacteria in the cooling system. And this is essentially all cooling systems after that initial start. So now once we've introduced the bacteria in the biofilm, it's all a matter of trying to control it um, and minimize the impact of it. I don't think we can ever totally eliminate uh, the biofilm or eliminate uh, bacteria in a, in a cooling tower system. So what's the best things that we can do? <clears throat> well, um, I think bacteria and, and biocontrol is the last frontier in cooling systems. I think it's the last frontier in membrane systems. I think we know pretty well how to control corrosion um, unless someone limits the, our choices by regulation or discharge or something. We know what causes scale. We, we have chemistries and understandings for that pretty well. Biocide becomes um, more difficult because there's so many things that go into the treatment uh, and, and the decision process, including things like what else is in there? What's the other chemistry? Can we com be compatible? What's our attitude on, on biocides and you know the impact on the environment and following discharge regulations? Are we worried about disinfection byproducts? Uh, how does it impact um, the costs of the programs? Everybody has their own preferences and experiences that goes into it. Um, site um, limitations, uh, retention times, calculations, um, theory. Um, it's just a, a, a lot that goes in that and also there's a lot to choose from. There's a lot of choices from types of chemicals and, and whether they're oxidizers or non-oxidizers. Um, so it, it's um, it can be overwhelming sometimes. No surprise here though that we have really um, three major um, treatment options. Maybe we use all of them, maybe we use one of them or two of them. Uh, so we're going to talk on each one of those, the oxidizing biocides, uh, the non-oxidizing biocides, and the, and the surfactants or biodispersants, and the benefits, and, and how you might select those or why you would want to use those under certain situations. Um, it's not going to be an extensive review of every one of them, but I want to touch on some major points, and especially why I think what I'm recommending here uh, from a consideration standpoint, why it makes sense in a, in a clean water system. So the oxidizing biocides, we'll start with those and probably spend most of the time on those because for me and for the reasons that I told you, you continuously have bacteria entering the cooling systems. So for me, it's logical that we continuously zap or kill those planktonic bacteria as they enter the system. And an oxidizing biocide does that quickly. Oxidizing biocides generally kill in seconds to minutes versus other mechanisms which are minutes to hours and, and mostly hours. So an oxidizing approach is a nice approach when we're trying to manage the system, when we're trying to continuously kill bacteria before they have a chance to migrate or form biofilm, or if we do have biofilm sloughing off that we can kill it as quickly as we can, or that we can keep that biofilm from becoming too thick. So oxidizing biocides, I think, are a very good strategy and certainly popular and have been used for a long, long time. Um, you know, the selection of the biocide um, and the oxidizing biocide, there's a lot that goes into that again, and it may vary based on region and regulations and so forth. I'm not going to hit every single product um, on there, but I am going to talk about the major chemistries and a little bit of advantages or disadvantages of each one. So some of the differences, again, besides the product or the chemistry itself, is they have certain um, limitations and they have certain advantages. Some have to be um, considered to be entered at a certain part in the system. Certainly something like uh, ozone or chlorine dioxide that are pretty vulnerable or, or, or volatile and have short half-lives. You want to feed those somewhere where you're going to get the best advantage um, if you're trying to oxidized sodium bromide, where's the best place to do that to make it hypobromous acid? Uh, all, all of those things on this list are 
considerations um, on the different oxidizers. One of those considerations, and I think one thing that's pretty well known, is how strong the oxidant is. And that's measured by ORP. Um, don't have all of them listed here, but I give you an idea of, you know, an, a hydroxyl free radical or ozone. Those guys zap pretty good. They're pretty strong. Peroxide, probably the most most common that we use in the commercial and institutional and mid-market is the hypochlorous and hypobromous acid. Fairly similar uh, ORP or oxidation potential, but uh, hypochlorous being a little bit stronger. Uh, it's interesting to look at chlorine dioxide. A lot of times people think that that's really a strong oxidant. It's, it's not as strong really as bromine or chlorine um, if it's hypobromous or hypochlorous but chlorine dioxide has advantages being a dissolved gas, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. <clears throat> chlorine gas is, you know, has been historically a, a used in, in larger cooling towers, industrial markets because of its uh, relative low cost um, and, and so forth. So it's not used in the institutional market, the regulations that have changed, the reporting requirements for chlorine, all of those things have really changed the approach, even in some larger cooling systems. Um, and, and so I'm gonna talk about chlorine as, as um, chlorine gas or as chlorine, as sodium hypochlorite, or even as calcium hypochlorite. Because in the end, we're all talking the same. It's how it got in there and we are ending up with HOCl or OCl um, as free chlorine in the cooling system. So on, on, on this slide and the next slide, let's just talk about the, the chemistry of chlorine, regardless of how it, how it gets to be there. Uh, because I, 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 have a, I have a proposal or a suggestion, uh, and I know a lot of people out there know this also or, or realize this, um, and they've experienced it themselves. Um, but I, I want to talk about chlorine, bromine, and DBNPA and pH a lot during this, this seminar or webinar uh, because I think that people make decisions um, based on that a lot and, and there's you know some other thoughts that can be given to that. So HOCl is this, the you know more active, more beneficial, the stronger oxidant in chlorine. If you have one ppm of free chlorine and you're at a pH of 7.54, which is the pKa of hypochlorous acid, at 7.54, that means that half of the free chlorine, which is the summation of OCl plus HOCl, is 50-50. 50% of it is HOCl, 50% is OCl at that, at that point. You go two pH units to the left or lower, and now you're at 99 plus percent HOCl. You go two pH units to the right or nine and a half and you're at 99 point some percent OCL, um, all being free chlorine. In continuous chlorination, both of those zap planktonic bacteria pretty good. Um, HOCL faster because it's a stronger oxidant, but OCL still kills planktonic bacteria pretty well. The, the thing that's interesting is the reservoir effect because they are in equilibrium with each other. So even if HOCl is the primary um, sterilant, as soon as it is reduced, the OCl comes back in, the reservoir effect, to stay in equilibrium with HOCl. So you don't really lose the ratio. And as long as you have free chlorine um, and you have HOCl doing the primary work, you can still get the benefit of chlorine even at high pH. Um, sometimes all you want to do is just carry a little bit higher residual. The advantage of the, the hypo is they've already neutralized the acidic effect of, of chlorine because chlorine gas, when you add it to water, a mole goes to hypochlorous and a mole goes to HCl. So it's actually consuming alkalinity in a cooling water or lowering the pH a little bit. Um, HO, or, uh, sodium hypochlorite has already been neutralized with caustic, so it's, it's actually going to raise the pH or add a little bit to alkalinity, but neither of, one of them would have an Im impact on a pretty low chlorine demand water. Um, so that's one of the things that I want to talk about today in this webinar also is, is chlorine demand and make sure we understand that most of the chlorine, even in the CNI market, goes to satisfying the demand and it doesn't take a whole lot more dosage of whatever the chemical is that's providing the oxidant 
to get you to your residual. So for some time now, um, people have been choosing bromine chemistry over bromide chemistry for high pH situations because the pKa of hypopromous acid is a little more than one pH unit higher. It's uh, the pKa is 8.65 which means at 8.65 pH, half of it's hypobromous and half of it's OBR. So it's, you know, it's got more acid at the form at the higher pH. So the theory is that it would be a better oxidant, hypobromous being stronger than hypobromide at the higher pH compared to fluorine. Um, I'm not going to argue that. That's absolutely true science. What I will argue is that a lot of times um, high pH waters have, have been satisfied and biological control uh, and, and even Legionella control has been as good and in many cases better with chlorine. Um, so the argument is, isn't an argument, it's what works. And at the end, that's what, you know, the best choice is, is what works for your water, for your situation. Um, but there's a lot of theory that goes into it. In the end, it's, it's what works. Um, Sodium bromide isn't really a biocide. It's, it's, it adds to the biocide. It cre helps create the hyperbromous acid if you're using sodium bromide and let's say sodium hypochlorite. It's a pretty inexpensive way to get onto bromine chemistry. You can mix it ahead of time, uh, kind of a static mixer so that you enter the cooling system as hyperbromous acid. Um, some people say, well, why should I satisfy the chlorine demand uh, or the oxidation demand with the more expensive hyperbromus. I'll just do that with the hypo, feed that directly to the cooling system, make sure I have enough bromide residual in the cooling tower so that any excess free fluorine will oxidize bromide and put me in bromine chemistry in the bulk water. E either way, um, both of those um, methods are and can be used and it, it may be an effective program. Bromine chemistry is really um, more common, uh, again, for the high pH, but also there's considerations as far as the molecule itself, bromamine being a stronger biocide than chloramine. Bromamine probably is unstable and you're really back to bromine chemistry much quicker, actually. Um, there is um, or are studies that show it may degrade phosphonates more than chloramines do. So again, other, other considerations. If you don't want to make your bromine chemistry on site, you can feed a, a liquid um, bromine solution, bromine chloride. So you can go directly into bromine chemistry instead of making it with sodium bromide or, or other methods. Another interesting oxidizer is a sulfamate stabilized chlorine that's in the same product with sodium bromide. Um, and we're going to talk about stabilizers because the nice thing about stabilizers, sulfamics, uh, acid is a stabilizer of chlorine. The chlorine actually becomes part of the sulfamate molecule and it penetrates biofilm much more readily than hypochlorous does or hypochlorite for sure. Um, and so does bromide. Bromide will concentrate within um, biofilm. So this product, uh, the theory behind it, and in practice, I think it's it's shown to work well. Um, penetrates biofilm, the, the lower pH within biofilm releases much, much of the chlorine from the stabilized uh, molecule, stabilizer molecule, and oxidizes bromide to form, form hypobromous acid uh, and kill the bacteria really within the biofilm. Same thing with BCDMH or any of the hydantuin um, halogen biocides. These are solid biocides and this is a, this is a very good selection, I believe, for relatively clean market, uh, clean water um, and continuous or, or intermittent feed. The hydantuin in this case is the stabilizing molecule. Um, so you've got stabilized bromine. Um, actually, I think that you have stabilized chlorine also, but the chlorine will probably go to oxidize the bromide that's been reduced as the hypobromous or the hydantuin brom um, bromine chemistry. Um, is used, uh, you, you get free bromide in the water and kind of like when you fed the sodium bromide with bleach, um, you're going to be reusing the bromide over and over again. 
Um, bromine will and chlor or bromamines will be volatile over the tower. There'll be some consumption, so you'll lose it over time. But BCDMH is a good strategy because you have stabilized forms of the halogen um, and it, it can penetrate biofilm uh, maybe better. Um, so uh, another good choice. Hydrogen peroxide and for acetic acid, um, good oxidizers. Um, nice advantage because they don't add chlorine and chlorine disinfection byproducts. They don't add chlorides. So not a bad choice if you have those kinds of concerns. Um, there's some handling issues. Um, dosages may be kind of high. You can look at costs, but hydrogen peroxide and prosthetic acid, um, not bad choices under certain conditions. I don't think it's the more common choice for a CNI market. Of course, I think people are aware of electrolytic uh, manufacturing um, on site using salt or high purity salt in a, in a um, electrolytic cell making either hypo or myox claims of the mixed oxidants which turns out to be mostly hypo and hydrogen peroxide. Um, maybe there's a free radical or two um, in there also. Uh, that's you know sometimes not a, a bad strategy for um, Plants, again, it, you're starting with a solid with salt. Um, so if shipping and issues are a problem, um, but not a primary selection choice, I don't think. Chlorine dioxide, I have experience with this uh, and, and I really like the molecule. Um, it's not that easy to get into cooling applications. For smaller markets, it may make sense sometimes to use the um, 0.3% solution and that's made in high purity water that is a stable product. But the most for the most part, chlorine dioxide is not a compressible gas. It has to be manufactured on site. There's different methods for doing that. Uh, it works well again where you have some concerns um, or history of biological problems. It's it's a specific oxidant, so it doesn't get consumed by a lot of organics, doesn't react with ammonia. So I think most of us probably know the, the good locations and uses for chlorine dioxide. Probably not a major um, concern in, uh, or selection in the clean water application. I do want to spend a little bit of time on just this idea of stabilized halogens in general. Um, and the major chemistries that I'm aware of that are used as stabilizers are the hydantoins, isocyanurate, and, and sulfamic acid, and I've discussed all of those already. Um, what they do is they basically um, keep the chlorine more stable, uh, prevent photo degradation. So you have chlorine in the system or bromine in the system for a longer period of time compared to just putting it in as, as the um, oxidant, the pure oxidant. Um, it does reduce ORP because now it's it's not a free chlorine for the most part or a free bromine. It's part of the molecule. So you'll see a substantial reduction in ORP. ORP may not be the best way to control it, although you might be able to. Um, the one thing about ORP in my experience is what's the required ORP? It's it depends you know, on your system, the chemistry, the pH. It, it goes back to what, what works, what works for your system. So I, I don't have a guideline recommendation for that, but I have seen some numbers um, with the different stabilizers uh, on the degree of reduction in ORP, and it can be pretty substantial. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, and maybe the best way to control these is looking at total chlorine uh, or maybe total and, and some free um, halogen or free chlorine. This is the uh, interesting part, um, and I've seen uh, the impact of overstabilizing in several cases. Um, and so I, I want to caution you, regardless of what the uh, stabilizer is, is you don't want to be feeding this so that you overstabilize the halogen. You don't want to get to the point where you've got too high a residual of the sulfamic or the hydantoin or the isocyanurate in the water because now it's going to detract too much from the oxidation cap capability. So 
how, how do you know? Um, well, you have to do the calculations. And for me, in a clean water application, I, I would call a clean water application a starting point is that if I was continuously chlorinated, uh, I wouldn't need more than three ppm of chlorine to satisfy the chlorine demand. And if I was shot feeding, I would need more than five or six ppm of, of chlorine to satisfy the chlorine demand. If that's the case, and unless you've got extremely long retention times, you're probably not going to overstabilize. Uh, but you can do spreadsheet calculations or, or just calculations looking at the contribution of halogen versus the, you know, what percent uh, based on that will be the stabilizer molecule that's in there. Uh, in this case, I did it for isocyanurate. I looked at about a one hour, no, about a one day retention time and a, a daily do, uh, dosage of about 5 ppm of free chlorine. And we, you know, at the end of each day or the beginning of the next dosage, were well below my concern for overstabilization. And it depends again on which the molecule is, but I'll say, you know, you can start around the 20 ppm range as being a concern. Maybe it's not till you get to 30 or 40. Maybe in some cases it's 15, um, but that's the kind of ballpark that I'm looking at. Moving on to the non-oxidizing biocides. Um, again, a little bit different in that they generally uh, work by different mechanisms of poisoning or, or, or killing uh, or microorganisms. So that process takes longer. You have to get to some sort of threshold concentration. Uh, the higher the threshold concentration, the faster the poisoning occurs. So that's looking at what's called the CT number or the concentration times time necessary for a kill. But generally most non-oxidizing biocides, um, you know, you're talking hours, um, sometimes down to minutes. Um, sometimes maybe even up to up to a day. Um, again, it depends on the biocide and the, and the bacteria themselves, what you're trying to kill. So um, a lot of choices, but maybe those choices are getting <laughs> more and more uh, hard or, or less and less um, available because of regulations and costs and so forth. But some of the more common ones, isothiazolin, DBNPA, TTPC, um, glutaraldehyde, some of the quats, all of those, they're, they're listed here. They all have advantages and disadvantages, safety concerns, um, you know, compatibilities, what pH you use them at, um, what that, that, you know, how they address the biological community, the algae, the fungus, the different types of, of bacteria. So lots of good options, lots of good choices, lots of good studies and arguments for using what you would use. Uh, but this is an AP Tech seminar, and I want to talk a little bit about why DBNPA is a good option. Um, just like um, fluorine can be a good option at high pH. DBNPA, when I first started my water treatment career, I was you know, taught all the different biocides. And one thing I was told about DBNPA is it hydrolyzes at high pH. So it's not your choice in alkaline cooling towers. Um, then years later, I had it in alkaline cooling towers and I still seem to get some efficacy from it. But much, much later, um, I started using it in reverse osmosis treatment and noticed that it was a biocide of choice even at high pH, it worked well. As a matter of fact, I began trying to shorten CIP, clean and place steps in membrane systems and started feeding it in the high pH CIP solution, the alkaline cleaning solution, realizing that it hydrolyzes at high pH. I might add it a few times over the course, you know, maybe every five or 10 minutes to take advantage of keeping a, a residual there. Uh, it worked well, it worked um, very well. Um, so I kind of went back to the, the, looking at the information uh, and Dow has a very good paper on it and Dow, um, you know, they have other biocide choices. I feel like DBNPA is a good choice, even at the high pH, reading the Dow information. Um, it, it kills rapidly in minutes, five, 10 minutes, certainly less than an hour. Uh, may not be 100% kill, but you can get several log to five log reductions in reasonable amount of time, even in alkaline um, waters. 
Um, you can look up and read all this in the, the Dow paper. I, I copied some of the pages here um, and some of the graphs. If you look at um, the half-life of DBNPA at, at different pHs, definitely goes down as the pH goes up. Big thing to notice in that first one is it's it's more stable at a more reasonable temperature in the CNI market than you'd see in a heavy industrial market. So temperature has a big impact on it. Um, but you still, even in the alkaline conditions, the, the second graph there is at a pH of 8.5, dosage relatively low at 2.5 ppm, and you still get very uh, reasonable kills in reasonable amounts of time, which is what I've experienced in, in the field. Um, this is probably fits into this, this whole argument that I'm making here um, the best in that it's very, very synergistic with halogens. So both of those curves on both of these, both um, sides, uh, are chlorine plus DBNPA um, compared to DBNPA or chlorine by themselves. This, show, this is showing basically percent removal or log reduction of viable organisms in, in the time. Uh, and so when you have uh, uh, halogenation, um, in conjunction with DBNPA, if you feel inclined or the need uh, or minimizing risk to also have to feed a non-oxidizing biocide or feel the benefit from it, uh, the synergy is uh, a strong argument for that in the DBNPA. The last group, group of chemicals, and I'm a strong advocate for these, are the biodispersants, organic cleaners, um, especially in controlling a biofilm. Um, it's going to help keep the surface clean, keep the biofilm um, thickness minimal, uh, and they're very effective. Um, they have, you know, just like washing your hands kills the COVID uh, or the coronavirus um, pretty quick. So there's advantages of, of how um, these different um, biodispersants can work uh, to minimize biofilm and the bacteria even themselves. Lots of choices on there, DTA2 type, the DMAD, the BSC8000, the, the quats. All of those are good programs supplementing a non-oxidizing and an oxidizing biocide. And the AP Tech product line includes those, some of those in solid form. So uh, here's kind of we're getting toward uh, the, the summation. Uh, continuous or intermittent biocide feed. I like to have rules to start with based on history or by, you know, at least having starting point. I'm just about anything I do in water treatment. And from a biocide standpoint, I like to start with continuous feed unless I find out I don't need it or I can do better without it. So continuous or intermittent, I say, hey, you're always contributing um, to bacteria in the system. You're always bringing in air. It makes sense to start thinking with some sort of continuous halogenation and an easy good way to do that is with a continuous feed of BCDMH or dichlor or something like that. If you're looking for a solid program, um, if um, you have a, a little dirtier water, um, oh, I mean, if you have a very clean water and you find that I don't need chlorination or bromination or continuous um, feed, then maybe you can back off a little bit and see, and see how it works. Uh, but for me, starting with continuous halogenation is the starting point. And then depending on risk, um, your experience, adding in an, in a bio deter or a biodispersant and adding in a non-oxidizer to supplement it, or if I have a particular type of bacteria or algae problem, if it's necessary, then that's that's the next step. So the, the intermittent, I guess, you can prove or disprove if that works. If, if the chlorine demand stays low enough after I shut off chlorine and my total counts don't get too high, or I, I'm monitoring biofilm by some method and they don't seem to get out of control, then intermittent feed may make, make sense. Um, in all of this, I, I would also consider your Legionella concerns. Um, I, I like the idea of continuous halogenation just to minimize um, the chance of Legionella floating around in my water somewhere. So here's my uh, suggested treatment strategy, kind of what I just said is start with some stabilized 
chlorine or bromine product as a starting point and start thinking continuous at some level, depending on your system, your pH, um, residual that you want in the performance. Go to intermittent if you if it makes more sense from a cost standpoint or if comparing you know, system volume and half-life and blowdown and dosages, it makes more sense, you know, to do all that stuff. Um, but then also, as you look at food source and, and nutrient loading and actual activity um, results, inspections and so forth, um, add biodispersant and non-oxidizing biocide to your cocktail or to your dosages as you see fit. fit or from the very beginning. I mean, if you do all of those, continuous um, halogenation, using a biodispersant and adding a non-oxidizing, that's the best start. Um, if, if, if cost isn't an issue and you are trying to minimize risk. Um, I kind of been hitting on my summaries other than I, I, I wanna say that there is a difference between clean water systems and dirty water systems or somewhere in between there. It has to do with chlorine demand, um, you know, where I need to start, how many non-oxidizers I might want to feed, which non-oxidizers I, I might want to use, which surfactant or biodispersant works the best. Um, but I think a, a, a technically sound approach is what, what I've been discussing. From an AP Tech, just to finalize with them before we get into questions, um, the, the halogenated um, Hydantuin is a great program, um, and so is Dichlor. Um, both of them, I like the, the idea of being uh, uh, more stable than uh, just feeding bleach or hypo or you know bromine. I like the idea that they penetrate biofilm well. Um, so it makes good sense. Um, the biodispersants, I like the DTA2 and the 8000 products that are available. Um, quats for me, not quite so much just because of maybe some concern with um, reaction with anionics in the water, but some it, they that, that can be considered too. Uh, the DBNPA, you know, as a solid, it makes sense in a cooling system because it is a quick killer. It works as a synergy with um, chlorine and the solid products don't add glycol like the liquid um, DBNPAs have. So maybe there's an advantage to that. Uh, but a point I'd like to make is don't not use solids if solids are a best fit for your um, corrosion and scale inhibitors um, because you have some liquid that you can't get as a, as a solid. You can still get the benefits and most of the benefits of applying your solid chemistry, uh, even if you want to use TTPC or liquid isothiazolin or whatever your, um, your preference is for whatever reason. Just a quick note that I've been talking about the primary biocides and the, and the biodispersants used. There's also other um, ones av available. They're not as popular or not used as much. MECT you could get as a solid, um, you can get the um, quats and carbamates and the, the SC8000 besides the DTA2 as solids available through AP Tech. And then just as that one slide at the beginning, I showed the best fit guide, um, the solids have some of the same advantages. You're not lugging um, pails or totes around, um, you know, it might may give you lead um, points. Um, it, it's um, got all of the same advantages that you would see on some of the reasons why you would be choosing um, corrosion and scale inhibitors as, as dries also. So the, the solid biocytes fit in as best fits. If they don't fit into your best fit, uh, please consider that the, the dry inhibitors can still give you advantages and you can use liquid biocides in conjunction with those. So at that, I turn it back over to Megan uh, for any questions and answers uh, session or um, Matt. Thank you very much. Oh. All right. Thanks, Dave, for all that great information. Um, yeah, we did get some questions that came in, so we're going to jump right in uh, since we have about 15 minutes left here. 
Um, the first question that we got is, how important are biodispersants? I tried to address that a, a little bit. I, I like biodispersants. If I, if I had a choice in a cooling tower and cost wasn't an issue, I'd probably have continuous halogenation or stabilized halogen. I'd probably have a biodispersant. I would probably have an unoxidizer biocide available to use as I wanted, and I would have side stream filtration to take out suspended solids. So the answer to that is not simple other than for me, I would prefer that it was part of every chemical treatment program for a cooling tower. That being said, um, it's not always possible because we have this thing called competition and, and so on and so forth. So uh, very valuable, especially as you get into a little bit riskier situations as far as nutrient lo loading and, and chance or histories of biofilm. And the nice thing is with, with solid chemistry is that we have multiple forms of the bio dispersant. So uh, you can use a uh, stick form uh, of the product and use it as just a kind of a clean up or intermittent shock feed. It doesn't have to necessarily be integrated into the dissolver technology in there. Uh, so there's there's ways to kind of utilize the chemistry, uh, whether you can justify it as the ongoing uh, part of the program or uh, as a supplemental, uh, something very safe and easy to, to apply when you're on site for a service visit. All right, great. We can move on to the next question then. Um, the next question is, what remediation strategy do we recommend for high Legionella counts? <laughs> okay, uh, that's one of the cases where I would say don't don't use a, a stabilized halogen because you don't want to overstabilize it. It's it's not going to be the choice. Um, so I would use a, a chlorine source for uh, convenience um, and ease. Whatever is best, calcium hypochlorite is a good choice. Um, you can look at your your specific water. For the most part, you're not going to add enough calcium to, to create a problem, but I don't want to say that in all situations. Sodium hypochlorite, um, you know, that's that's a pretty mainstay product, but high level of, of chlorine without the stabilizer would be my um, first answer. And of course, there's a lot of um, remediation that goes on with non-oxidizing biocides also. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Um, let's see. How does ORP free chlorine and total chlorine relate? Okay, so if I went back to that chart um, that showed ORP, free chlorine means I have, uh, depending on pH, HOCl and OCl in water. If all of it was HOCl, the ORP of HOCl is much higher. Um, so that would be the 1.56 or whatever the millivolts was that it showed. If it was all OCL, the ORP would be, you know, more like 0.48 or 0.5 or something like that. If the pH is such that I have some combination in between those two, then my ORP is, you know, some ratio between those two. So ORP really has to do a lot with the form of the halogen, uh, which is also then based on pH. Okay, we have a couple more here. Um, next question is, what about other solid non-oxidizing biocides? Is AP Tech working on any others? I'll let Matt take that one. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, we AP Tech, we're always, uh, leveraging our relationships with suppliers, partners out there, uh, whether they're domestic based or internationally based to, to see what other viable options are out there. You know, the, the, the challenging part of things with biocides is we've got regulatory components to it and the costs and, and efforts and time, even if you're just changing the form of a of a biocide has to go through a process. Um, you know, years ago we did have that uh, successful project uh, move forward that, that gave us some uh, viable uh, alternative option. Fortunately, just because of uh, economics and other factors that you know impacted manufacturing side of it, it just wasn't sustainable long term. But uh, we're always looking for that uh, complementary chemistry um, to to meet needs. As Dave alluded to, um, if you're in a situation where 
you need just that little extra boost and it, the liquid's available, there's no reason uh, you wouldn't. You're, you want to solve problems and, and provide robust programs. So uh, it's just really finding the, the program and, and the, the combination and, and how you're applying it, which we're going to talk about in the next webinar is really implementing a solid program and, and looking at the data and looking at you know the, the things that go into uh, being successful. Whether or not it's solids or liquids, you have to you need to go through the same process uh, to be uh, effective. So um, we'll do that uh, in the next webinar and hopefully be able to shed some additional light on uh, how to be very successful in doing so. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, I'm looking through and it looks like we've answered all the questions we have on our side. Are any other out there that you guys see or want to or want to address? Looks good. All right. Well, again, thanks for joining us today. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, we can reach out to you um, via email, or if you'd like to shoot us an email, you can do that as well. Um, sales at aptechsolids.com is our email address. Um, also, be on the lookout for an email from us that will contain a link to Dave's technical paper that coincides with the PowerPoint that he did today. Um, and also, we'll be in contact about the follow-up webinar. That's again how to implement a solid chemistry biocide program. That'll take place probably around the beginning of May. So just keep your eyes open again for an email or look on our LinkedIn page, which we're trying to stay up to date on. Um, we like to post quite often, so keep up with that. And just in conclusion, on on behalf of Dave, Matt, and the entire AP Tech team, we really want to thank you for joining us, and thanks for your continued support of AP Tech Solid Chemistry. Thanks a lot, guys.